All right, welcome to weeks four and five. Um, this, these two topics are so interconnected and so important that I thought um, they really deserve two weeks to kind of get into looking at liaison librarianship, at faculty attitudes towards librarians, building collaboration with faculty, and um, embedding information literacy into the curriculum. There's a lot to cover in, in just within those topics. So this week we're going to look at the changing roles and responsibilities of liaison librarians, look at different possibilities for collaborating with disciplinary faculty, um, also challenges in developing collaborative relationships with faculty. We'll look at how subject librarians can embed information literacy into the curriculum um, in lots of different ways, especially though through building relationships with faculty. And finally, we're going to look at different models for com curriculum embedded instruction. Um, the readings this week, are, or these two weeks, are really interesting. Um, and I'm going to keep this lecture fairly short because I want you to watch a really great video um, from the ACRL conference, which I think is also really illuminating on how curriculum um, mapping can be used in creating collaborative relationships and um, embedding information literacy into the curriculum. So traditional subject liaisons sort of were, were predicated on this notion of a three-legged stool where you were involved in collection development, instruction, and reference. And this differed at some institutions. In some places, um, it was separated between bibliographers and instruction librarians, where, for, say, history would have a bibliographer who did the collection development and an instruction librarian who did the teaching. I think that is deeply problematic because you find, as a liaison, that when you're doing instruction, you learn about inadequacies in the collection. When you're doing collection development, you learn about areas um, where instruction would be valuable and helpful. And if you don't have the same person involved in both of those areas, you end up, you know, having this disconnect where you're not, where you don't necessarily have all the information to serve um, the students and faculty in that area properly. But at most institutions, librarians are involved in in a, a single in a subject doing collection development instruction and reference um, but if you look, read the um, Duke report where they looked at the different responsibilities of liaison librarians you can see that that's changing pretty significantly liaisons today still do instruction reference and collection development and even in and of itself that's quite a lot. I mean, I know I came out of library school having taken a collection development class, but I didn't feel that that actually prepared me in any way for doing collection development um, in a specific subject area because the amount you need to learn about that subject area and the research your faculty are doing and the classes that are being taught to actually do a good job doing collection development um, is quite complex and takes a lot of time and effort. Um, instruction, a lot of a lot of librarians don't even take instruction classes. My library school only offered one um, that was geared towards K to 12 librarians. So there really wasn't anything that prepared me for really doing teaching other than other teaching experience I had outside of librarianship. But now, um, you know, subject librarians are expected to really be a lot less passive. They're expected to go out and into their departments and make progress toward library goals. So it's they're really meant to be more proactive and doing a lot of engaging with faculty and students, doing outreach and really trying to reach them with, rather than just waiting for the faculty members and students to contact us. Um, we're getting more involved in research services, helping faculty with their research, data management plans, etc. Um, with the growth of online learning, a lot of subject librarians are expected to be able to create learning objects, um, online research guides, and other tools to support students at their points of need, both face-to-face -face and online. Um, we're in certain areas, people are doing a lot more with digital scholarship, especially those in um, the humanities and social sciences. 
Um, in the sciences, there's a lot more going on with um, the need for data management plans and library support in those areas. Every librarian these days is expected to be pretty knowledgeable about scholarly communication issues, and subject librarians are often asked to help out with things like, um, you know, negotiating um, agreements with authors, with um, author agreements with publishers, and helping determine where to publish, and helping them get their stuff into a um, institutional repository. So we're expected to be pretty knowledgeable about that stuff. Um, in some institutions, we're expected to be involved in fundraising in those areas. Um, last year, we were asked to provide case statements that sort of described what the needs are in our liaison areas that um, our development officer could go out and try to do some fundraising in. We're expected to help faculty keep current in their own areas as well as for us to be current. And we're also expected to keep up with curricular changes both at the sort of the macro university level and in our individual departments. That is a tremendous amount of stuff um, to ask a liaison to do. And, you know, what works in one institution is not necessarily going to work in another. I mean, in one department is not necessarily going to work in another. But to, to expect a single librarian to have all of these skills and then be able to go into different subject areas, like for example, I said, I'm the liaison for five different departments. So to expect that I'm going to have the expertise to go into each and every one of them and do these things is, is quite a lot to ask. But it is what we do as liaison librarians, and we're constantly having to keep up and learn new things. And you'll find um, that there's no one clear path. And every institution, every department, has different needs. You know, in some cases, you're going to be spending a lot of time on scholarly communications issues. On others, it's instruction. On others, it's a heavy collection development load, or you have to do a lot of talking with faculty to do adequate collection development. There's no one um, model or best practice that works in every sort of department, because every department has a different culture and different needs. Um, and also, in terms of really building relationships with departments, there isn't any one way that, oh, that you can say, oh, this is the way that you can do it, and you're totally going to build great relationships. I've worked with, I think, probably 15 different departments in my time in working in libraries, and every single one is different. Um, you know, some you really build relationships based on doing collection development work. In others, it's about, um, you know, showing expertise in scholarly communications. In others, it's just being really responsive and helpful. In others, instruction is the hook that gets them in. You just never know what that hook's going to be until you get to know the department. Um, and also, every liaison has different strengths. Um, Different liaisons are going to focus in different areas. I'm sure I focus a lot more on instruction than some of my colleagues because that's an area that I'm really passionate about, whereas some of my colleagues are amazingly knowledgeable about um, collection development issues, much more so than I am, and focus more on that in their work. But, you know, getting, getting to a place where you can really get faculty to think of you as a member of their team. I mean, that's the goal. And what works in different places is going to be completely different. Um, and, and even within a department, individual faculty member are going to need different hooks to kind of get hooked into thinking of you as a partner. In the second, um, in the library with the lead pipe article that I asked you to read this week, um, they describe three different levels of support for departmental instruction. And these aren't, you know, good or bad in and of themselves. They're just different ways to approach um, instruction and depending on how well you can integrate with the department. Um, supplemental is sort of um, like offering workshops and instruction outside of the curriculum where you're not teaching a one-shot 
library instruction session for a class, you're offering it more for a certain subject area. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes these are actually a very excellent way to reach out to students. For example, I did um, a workshop recently for conflict resolution grad students, and these tend to be returning students who've been out of school a long time. And having a workshop for the, those that are new really helped to sort of get them off on the right foot with research. I also gave them some tips on like managing informa research information as you get it, teaching them about citation management tools and developing a system. And that was amazingly helpful and helped to build relationships between me and the students. That doesn't mean that I'm not also trying to get into important classes, but you know this is one important way to be doing that. Um, then there's integrated, which is obviously a librarian being involved in the class, but not actually being involved in designing the curriculum. So that's when, you know, a professor calls you up and says, "Hey, Meredith, uh, my English 102 class is is doing a research project, and I'd really like you to like to have them come visit the library, and you could teach them how to find stuff in JSTOR or whatever." Those are that's the typical kind of instruction that most librarians are doing. You know, we we're responding to their need and we're just doing whatever it is that they asked for, which is not a bad thing and is sometimes all we can do with a specific faculty member. You know, and some faculty members are really open to collaborative development of an assignment and instruction and others just, you know, want to tell you what to do in their class, and frankly, it is their class, so that's not a bad thing. And then embedded instruction, which um, is really about co-development of um, an assignment or the curriculum or of a specific course or even, um, you know, just the, the design of how you're going to approach um, teaching in the class. And this often comes with um, a faculty member that you've already built close relationships with, who thinks of you as a, a partner in teaching. And that, that can take time. Other times it's just a faculty member who's really open to new ideas. So my approach, and this obviously is different for different departments that I work with, but my, my approach is really to make myself useful to faculty. I think that's a great way to sort of start off with the caveat that you don't want them to think of you just as like a secretarial person and a support staff who just, you know, gets them whatever they need. You know, I like doing assertive collection development. I like contacting faculty when I know there's that in their area of research um, our collection is weak and to talk to them about what their needs are and how I can meet them. So doing that kind of collection development rather than waiting for faculty to contact me. Also, um, helping faculty with their own research I think can really help prove myself as to them as a really competent and um, useful partner. So I, I've worked with a bunch of faculty members on helping them with their lit reviews. Um, if they're doing research in a new area, sort of helping them see the landscape of research in that area. Um, in some cases, scholarly communications is the hook and, you know, telling faculty about our institutional repository and how they can um, get more attention for their research by making it freely available, how they can um, negotiate with publishers to be allowed to put stuff in the institutional repository, etc. That's a great hook that shows me as, again, a really competent um, and useful partner. And then just be just my general eagerness to support students. I think when they see that you're really earnest and responsive to their needs and you're even going out of your way to do things to support their, th them and their students, it really makes a difference. Um, and sometimes you feel like, gosh, why am I doing these things? You know, why am I making such an effort? But eventually it really does end up bearing fruit. And I found over the years when I was a social sciences librarian at Norwich, you know, at first my, my, um, interactions with faculty were largely they'd ask me to buy something and I'd buy it but over time it began to be oh let's talk about this class I'm teaching next term and let's see what we can do to partner on that class so it it did lead to other things I also think another important 
approach is going for the low-hanging fruit. So in any department, there will probably be some faculty members who you can really easily work with. Sometimes it's getting in with new faculty when they're, you know, bright and shiny and eager um, and getting getting into their classes and doing some interesting stuff and then hoping that they spread the word. That was how I got into um, our psychology research methods class at, my, at Norwich was by working with another um, faculty member in a class that really wasn't like a critical class in psychology, but one I wanted to be involved in because she was a great faculty member to work with. And then she told the faculty member who was teaching research methods about how great the class went, and suddenly I was getting a request to teach in that class. So, you know, you, sometimes it feels like we're doing things that aren't exactly what we'd like to be doing ultimately, but they can lead to those goals that we have. So another point of view um, that you'll hear, some argue that librarian efforts rarely lead to meaningful collaboration. Um, Bill Badke talks a lot about that in some of his articles. And um, some argue that librarians should instead establish themselves as a discipline and offer credit information literacy classes. Some say we should offer classes like that in within the disciplines, which makes a bit more sense to me. But unless it's a required component of a discipline, we're not going to ever be able to reach every student in a given major by taking that approach. My feeling is that there will always be faculty who see us as valuable partners and are open to collaborating in meaningful ways. And at the same time, there will be faculty members who see us as being at their service, which in many ways we are. I know a lot of librarians have issues with the idea that we're a support unit. And I'd love it too if faculty, every faculty member saw us as a partner or an equal, but the reality is that we need to work within a paradigm where librarians are thought of both as service providers and partners, because we are both, and we need to find ways to develop relationships where we can both provide great service and be respected and effective partners. And that's challenging. So you're going to be reading a lot of case studies this week that show how librarians can embed information literacy into the curriculum, often through incremental change. And you'll see that the process always starts with developing relationships with faculty members. And as you'll notice in many of these studies, the more you work with a faculty member, the more you may be able to do with their class. You know, it may start as you're just coming in to teach um, whatever they want you to teach, but maybe the next time you do it, you can help co-design the assignment, or you can um, have a pre-assignment that they do in class. The more faith they have in you, the more likely they're going to become open to more experimentation, more class time, embedding material into the class, etc. So that iterative process is really an important part of this. Going in and expecting that a, a faculty member you just built a relationship with is going to let you try something totally different from what they're familiar with isn't always going to work, is frequently not going to work. Um, you'll see a lot of trial and error, and this is a big part of building information literacy into the curriculum. You try, you assess, you retool. Curriculum mapping, as you'll see, can be a really important step towards embedding in the curriculum. Um, at Norwich, I worked with our Masters of Business Administration program. Um, I worked with the program administrators to really define what information skills a graduating student needed to have, and then looked at where those were taught and assessed throughout the curriculum and how we could sort of embed information literacy instruction and assessment into those areas. And often it was in a really small way, just tweaking an assignment, making a little change, um, having them read something different that week. Do, you know, it was very small things, but they made a big difference. And you could see um, clearly where information literacy was being taught and assessed throughout the curriculum through that mapping. It was very exciting. But sometimes you're going to find the curriculum doesn't lend itself to easily embedding information literacy. Um, some programs have no re single required course. Some don't have a research methods class. Um, you know, you try to look for those keystone classes. You look for ones that are cons consistently offered and are research intensive. You know, you need to find places where being in the curriculum makes sense, but it's not always easy to do.
Sometimes embedding in the curriculum is only a product of your relationship with the particular instructors who teach the class. And I've certainly learned that the hard way where I had a great relationship in this one history course that was uh, critical to the major and then a different person ended up teaching it and they wanted to do things in a totally different way. Um, so, you know, you're not really embedded in the curriculum if you're only embedded at the level where um, where the faculty where you're embedded with the particular faculty member not with the particular class so because then you're starting from scratch when another instructor takes up over the course and a lot of curriculum embedment is not necessarily about getting rid of the one shot I know librarians are really down on the one shot sometimes on doing you know a single session within a course but sometimes it's just about putting that one shot into the right places in the curriculum and ensuring that what students learn is repeated and built upon in other places in the curriculum. And that doesn't necessarily have to be by a librarian. Um, sometimes, and sometimes it's, you know, we're just creating, you know, online tutorials and other activities that extend learning beyond the session that we do. Um, there are lots of different models that don't necessarily require a tremendous increase in time. So you'll be reading some great stuff this week, and I really look forward to hearing um, what you think about um, curriculum embedment and subject librarianship.